Let's Talk About Kidneys takes a deep dive into the chronic kidney disease patient journey. We're here to inspire meaningful conversations and to help people living with CKD gain a full understanding of their disease. Deciding on what type of dialysis is best for you can be challenging. Listen to what Dr. Ritchie has to say about making a choice that best fits your needs. Hello, Dr. Ritchie. Thank you again for uh, taking the time to uh, sit here and go over some very important information. Now, I think this topic is going to be one that is in depth, is, is extremely important. We're talking about the types of dialysis. Okay. What types of dialysis are best for each patient? And then we'll go through an overview of the three different types of dialysis. Okay. All right. So let's begin with when is dialysis necessary? That's a very complicated question. So when patients are following uh, with their nephrologist, they're used to looking at their what they call their kidney number. And that could be a number called a GFR or creatinine level. And, and that's really how we gauge how a patient's kidney function is progressing. What I tell my patients is we start dialysis when your kidneys can no longer safely support you. Now, what I mean by that is, are we seeing things on their blood work that could potentially be life-threatening? So for example, uh, a very common indication to start dialysis would be a high potassium level. You know, our, our kidneys excrete potassium, and that keeps that level down, which, which keeps us safe. But if a patient's kidneys cannot excrete that, that potassium has to come out somehow. Okay. And so that's, that's one indication. Uh, same thing with uh, increased acid buildup in their bloodstream. Uh, another common reason we start patients is because of what we call fluid overload. You know, our kidneys are the, really the main way we get rid of extra fluid. And so... If you're swelling or have fluid build up and it's making its way into your lungs, if the kidneys cannot get rid of that fluid, then it has to come out somehow. And that's, again, another indication for dialysis. And then the last indication would just be how the patient feels. You know, um, chronic kidney disease and progressive kidney failure, you know, there comes a point when the patient just feels bad. You know, they can't necessarily put their finger on it, but you know, they have no energy, they lose their appetite, they just feel terrible. And, and that is a very common indication for initiation of dialysis. Okay. And when you say feeling terrible, I know people these days are sluggish or work kind of overloads them, but feeling terrible. I think the most common thing I hear from patients is I, I can't do the things I normally used to do. You know? Okay. Even getting out of bed every day is difficult. Um, like I said, weight loss is very common because patients stop eating. So when you see those particular things, uh, to me, that's an indication that, hey, we have this therapy that's going to help. We need to start it. Okay. And so what are the types of dialysis? So there are three uh, main options for our patients. Um, one is what we call in-center hemodialysis. Then we have home hemodialysis, and then we have peritoneal dialysis. And, and these are all very different types of therapies. So by far the most common one that we, we have patients uh, do is called in-center hemodialysis. You know, we have these dialysis centers that people drive by them all the time. They're, they're standalone buildings or clinics, and the sole purpose is for providing these dialysis treatments. Um, you know, patients go in there, they get their dialysis, they come home. Um, outside of that, uh, we have home dialysis. Uh, home dialysis comes in two forms. Uh, home hemodialysis, which is it's the same process as the patients who go to the center. They, we just uh, train them and provide them with the equipment to do this at home. Okay. And then peritoneal dialysis, which is also a home therapy, but it's quite different than the hemodialysis. But again, that's a home therapy that they can do we train them, we give them all the equipment and everything, and they can do that at home. Okay. And so what you said is different than peritoneal and hemo, mm -hmm. home hemo, are different. What is the major difference in those two? So hemodialysis, hemo meaning blood, uh, essentially in hemodialysis, uh, a patient has their blood run through a machine, and that machine cleans it, 
uh, it removes extra fluid, and then the cleaned blood is then returned back to the patient. You know? So both the in-center hemodialysis and the home hemodialysis have kind of basically the same type of uh, machines and the same um, you know, treatment. Peritoneal dialysis is very different. So peritoneal dialysis, uh, we utilize the, the patient's own body to do the filtering. So what we do is we, there's a catheter that goes into the patient's abdomen. And inside the abdomen, there's a what we call the peritoneum. It's a membrane. You know, and we give them a special fluid. The fluid goes into their abdomen. And through that peritoneum, you get exchange of toxins and uh, fluid removal. And then you empty that fluid out from the abdomen. So it's, it's a different way okay. of kind of achieving the same thing. Okay. And so you, you mentioned um, in perit- peritoneal, it's a, it's a certain access. So Correct. can we talk about the different accesses that yeah. we use for hemo and peritoneal? Yeah. So hemodialysis, again, we have to have access to the patient's blood. Uh, unfortunately, we can't use just like an IV. There, there has to be a special access. And so the most common um, access that we, we want to use is either what we call an AV fistula or an AV graft. AV means uh, arterial venous. And so what happens is uh, through a surgical procedure, an artery and a vein are sealed together. And so basically you're, you're getting blood flow through the artery directly into the vein. And that usually doesn't happen in the human body. And what that does is that gives us uh, access to that high blood flow rate through a vein. And so what you end up getting is uh, a couple needles in in that vein that gives us access to run the blood through the machine and then back into your body. Okay. Okay? And those accesses are the same whether you're doing uh, home hemodialysis or in center. So for peritoneal dialysis, like I mentioned, you get a, a special catheter that goes inside your abdomen. Um, it sits down kind of in your lower pelvis the in, on the inside, and then you have a, a certain a small length of tubing that uh, uh, comes from under the skin outside where you can access it and put the fluid in and out. Okay. All right. And so you talked about hemodialysis and home hemodialysis. Mm-hmm. Let's get into that. What would qualify a patient to be able to do home hemodialysis? So there's, you know, there's, I'd say most patients can do home hemodialysis, but I think what we look for, uh, first of all, the patient has to be able to take part in their treatment. So if the patient uh, is unable to uh, do any of the training themselves, then we we don't really consider them uh, good candidates. Um, They have to have good vision. Um, It's suggested that they have good family support and even sometimes we we recommend they have a caregiver go through the training with them so they have backup uh they need to have good vision because you know there are there are connections they have to um, access their bloodstream you know be able to work the machine things like that right um and then they have to have um have to have an appropriate space at home uh, to do these treatments and, and these are all things that we look at before we actually train someone Okay, so when you say appropriate space, um, walk a patient through that. Is it is like a do do a nurse come out or a medical professional come out and kind of take a look at the home environment, or can you expand on that? Yeah, the they do have a nurse come out. They do what we call a home visit. Okay, uh, they come and not only do they make sure this that you have the appropriate space, they'll actually sit there with you and work through. Okay, your machine goes here, your supplies go here. So that way, you know when all these things come to your home, you know exactly where they're going to go. You're going to know exactly how this is going to be set up. Okay. And so what would disqualify a patient from being um, a candidate for home hemo? I know you said a bad vision, um, not being involved in their care. Is Mm -hmm. there anything else that would disqualify them? Well, if if their home is not conducive, uh, you know, again, some people just don't have the space. There's quite a bit of supplies and equipment that go with this. Um, so that's one thing. Um, a lot of times, just the amount of training that it requires, some patients don't have the time to do this training. And so that sometimes that will um, prevent them from going forward tr- with this modality. Okay. And so we kind of touched on the most common type of home dialysis. Is it hemo or is it peritoneal? The most common is peritoneal. Peritoneal. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, and why I, is that? Uh, it's, it's considered an easier therapy to learn. Uh, like I said, the home hemodialysis training can take anywhere from four to six weeks. Um, peritoneal dialysis, you're look, looking about seven to 10 days on average to train to do that. It's a very simple procedure, um, really can train anybody to do that. Okay. And so what is the typical hemodialysis schedule? So if you're talking about an in-center treatment, uh, the in-center patients will dialyze three days a week. And that's typically on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or a Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday schedule. And on average, I'd say most people dialyze about four hours per treatment. Four hours per treatment. So kind of getting off, not necessarily getting off topic, but do you see that a lot of individuals are unable to work? How does that affect their social life, being committed to three days a week, you know, four hours a day? I mean, that's 12 hours, and the work week is... And w- what we tell people is in-center hemodialysis is more than just the time frame where you're sitting in that chair receiving dialysis. So, of course, there's the travel time to and right. from the unit, but in-center hemodialysis can be somewhat difficult for patients to recover from afterwards. So a lot of patients after treatment will actually go home and sleep or rest because it, it's a hard, it's a rough treatment to go through. Uh, and you're trying to fit, you know, two days worth of, um, I guess, filtering or kidney function into a four-hour treatment. And so, um, you know, it is very difficult for patients to maintain a normal work schedule. Uh, and a lot of times they, they do, the day they dialyze, you know, they just realize, hey, I'm, I'm kind of um, going to be out of it the rest of the day. Okay. And so, and what is a typical schedule for a peritoneal um, dialysis? Peritoneal dialysis is a seven-day-a-week treatment. All right, we the, you do this every day. Uh, now, there's different ways to do it. There's uh, a machine that can do this treatment for you while you sleep. Some patients are able to just do the peritoneal exchanges while they sleep, and then when they wake up in the morning, they can disconnect and go about their day normally. Uh, other patients require uh, treatments throughout the day as well. And that can be what we call manual exchanges, where they, they put fluid in and then uh, manually drain that fluid out. Or they can just put fluid in early in the morning and leave it there throughout the day and, and receive dialysis that way. But it is the, w- the most important thing to tell patients is it's a seven-day-a-week treatment. You know, that there's, there's no skipping days. Okay, seven days a week, but then sleeping. So you mentioned a... Fluid exchange throughout the day. Mm-hmm. What time frame is that fluid exchange? So the fluid, when, when it goes in, uh, it depends on the prescription, but it will stay inside their abdomen for anywhere from two to four hours before it is exchanged for, an, for a new set of fluid. Obviously, dialysis is a medication in itself, mm-hmm. but are there any additional medications that are in combination with dialysis? Yeah. Um, how does that work? Um, I would say most of our patients still require antihypertensive medications or medicines to lower their blood pressure. Um, so that's a very common medicine. Um, we use what we call phosphorus binders. Um, a big issue with our patients on dialysis is their, their bodies still retain a lot of phosphorus, which can cause a lot of uh, long-term complications with their bones and their blood vessels. So we try to get that level down. And to do that, we use these medications, and, and they take them every time that they eat. That'll help bind up phosphorus so that they don't absorb it. Uh, beyond that, most of our patients are also anemic. They have low blood counts, and so we give them medications typically uh, to help bring their blood counts up. Uh, so those are the most common ones. We, we also use vitamin D, but you know, uh, other than that, most whatever medicines they're on before, a lot of times they're on the same regimen uh, as they are after they start dialysis. Okay. And so I know you talked about phosphorus and phosphorus binders and, you know, com- combining that with their diet. Are there any special diets or dietary restrictions for patients that do dialysis? Mm-hmm. It's a fairly restrictive diet. So uh, we ask our patients to monitor salt intake, uh, phosphorus intake, and protein intake. You know, now protein, we want them to eat more of it, more right? Of it. Okay. Phosphorus and salt, we want them to restrict that as much as possible. Um, oh. So that 
those are the main dietary um, uh, issues that we deal with. What are some examples for those that don't know of foods that have high phosphorus? High phosphorus, the most common would be dairy products. Uh, dairy products, cheese, milk, uh, ice cream, things like that are, are usually your highest phosphorus content. And then I did have another question. So you talked about um, the trainings for hemo, home hemodialysis mm -hmm. and home peritoneal dialysis. Mm -hmm. um, one was 7 to 10 days and one was four to six weeks. Why is there such a, a vast difference in the amount of time? Uh, there's more to learn as far as the home hemodialysis. And, and one of the big differences is with home hemodialysis, you're actually accessing you know, this, these fistulas or grafts. And so you know, putting a needle into one of these accesses, there are, there's certainly a risk as far as bleeding. So we do a lot of training with patients, making sure they feel comfortable, um, you know, putting these needles in and accessing these, these fistulas and grafts. I, I think that takes up a, a lot of time. Okay. And then again, the machine's a little bit more complicated. It just, there's, there's, you have to learn all the uh, bells and whistles on the machine, understand um, how to troubleshoot. Okay. That's it for the questions that I have, but I do want to just kind of have you summarize because you're the specialist in mm -hmm. the dialysis. If you could give us three main points to um, have patients or even professionals that are listening to take away about dialysis. So dialysis is a last resort, right? We do it because we have no choice to do it. But, you know, a lot of patients think of dialysis as, you know, they hear stories on, uh, from family and friends um, about how terrible it is. And you know, I think if what we try to get our patients to do is we want them to take their health care into their own hands. So we, we try to get patients to go into home dialysis more so these days. Um, they tend to feel better, and, you know, they get to be more involved in their care. You know, so we under, understanding that this is a therapy that if they start it, it's because they have to start it. But we still want people to be engaged, and we want them to try to live as normal life as possible. And so to go into home therapies, I think, is something that most nephrologists now are, are really trying to stress, you know, for the patient because it is just better for them. Well, thank you again for being with us today to talk about the different types of dialysis. So um, patients that are listening can understand what their options are when choosing this type of modality of treatment. And um, you did an awesome job. So thank, thank you, you very much. Me. Thanks for tuning in today. Learn more about Dallas Nephrology Associates at www.dnef.com. That's D-N-E-P-H dot com. And if you found the information valuable, be sure to share with those who are impacted by chronic kidney disease. Dallas Nephrology Associates DNA podcast series, Let's Talk About Kidneys, is provided for general information purposes only and does not replace the need to talk with a healthcare professional about your unique situation, care, and options. Our goal is to provide you with as much information as possible so you can be as informed as possible. Reference to any specific product, service, entity, or organization does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by DNA. The views expressed by guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity or organization they represent. The views and opinions expressed by DNA employees, contractors, or guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of DNA or any of its representatives. Some of the resources identified in the podcast are links to other websites. These other websites may have differing privacy policies from those of DNA. Please be aware that the internet sites available through these links and the material that you may find there are not under the control of DNA. DNA shall have no responsibility for the accuracy, legality, or content of the external site or subsequent links. Contact the external site for answers to questions regarding its content. The resources included or referenced in the podcast and on the website are provided simply as a service. DNA does not recommend, approve, or endorse any of the content on the link sites. The content provided on this website and in the podcast is not medical advice and should not be used to evaluate, diagnose, treat, or correct any medical condition. The content is solely intended to educate users regarding chronic kidney disease, end-stage renal disease, ESRD, end-stage kidney disease, ESKD, and related conditions, and ESRD, ESKD treatment options. None of the information provided on this website or referenced in the podcast is substitute for contacting a healthcare professional.